Hello and welcome to this time of worship. I'm Reg Berg and I'm the pastor of Prince of Faith Lutheran Church here in Calgary, Alberta. Today is Thursday, August 19th, 2021, and this Sunday coming up will be the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. As we join in this time of worship today, we'll have the opportunity to sing along with or simply listen to some songs. We'll hear some readings from the Bible. We'll spend a bit of time together in prayer. And we'll also have the opportunity to share in God's gift to us of Holy Communion. More on that later. I gotta say, it's good to be back with you. It was great to get away for a bit. Over the course of two weeks, I put about 4,000 kilometers on my bike, not including a few ferry rides. Beautiful scenery. Overall, we had good weather. Although I do now know what it's like to be a brisket, you know, slow roasted and smoked. We rode out into BC, out to Vancouver Island, down to Salt Spring Island, took a ferry up the inside passage to Prince Rupert, then back home through Prince George, Jasper, the Icefields Parkway, and the Banff, and finally back onto the prairies. It was good to get away. It was a wonderful trip, and it's good to be home. Before we go any further today, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that Prince of Faith Lutheran Church and the land on which we live, work, and play are on Treaty 7 land. These are the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai Nations, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley Nations, and the Sutina Nation. Southern Alberta is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We acknowledge the many First Nations and Métis people who have lived on and cared for these lands for generations. We're grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. Even though this is admittedly a small step, we make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and an expression of gratitude to those on whose territory we reside. Today, as we begin this time of worship, we'll start by intentionally coming to God to confess that we have fallen short of living as the people God wants us to be, and even more importantly, we'll hear God's word of forgiveness to us. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, and the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ, and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Well, here's the good news. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. So hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. As those who have been forgiven and reconciled to God, seek to share that same forgiveness and reconciliation with others. Amen. Amen. Our opening song today is maybe not as familiar as some songs, but I love its message. This song comes to us from our sisters and brothers at St. Columba's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. The song, All Who Hunger Gather Gladly. All who hunger gather gladly, holy man on his Oh, 
Let's pray together. Holy, Holy God, God, your, your word feeds your people with life that is eternal. eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth, that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the book of Joshua. Let me give you just a word of introduction to it. In the Near East, covenant means agreement or alliance. A covenant describes relationships. It's the primary word used to characterize the relationship between God and the people of Israel. By delivering Israel, God has already begun that relationship. And in this passage, we hear Joshua calling the people to respond. Our first reading today comes from the book of Joshua. Chapter 24, verses 1 to 2a and 14 to 18. Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, including their elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented, presented themselves to God. Joshua said to the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols you an your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the lo Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the God your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will, you be the or, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. The people replied, we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performs mighty miracles before our very eyes. As we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is some verses from Psalm 34. Let's read it responsibly. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. For the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. Calamity will surely overtake the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. The next reading we're going to hear today is from the letter to the Ephesians in the Bible. And in this passage, it's kind of like a general giving a rousing speech to troops before battle. This letter closes by calling on Christians to be equipped for spiritual warfare against evil. The full armor of God includes truth, righteousness, peace, faith, the gift of salvation, and the word of God inspired 
by the Spirit. Our second reading today is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith and stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan for the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him, as I should. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading today is from John chapter 6, verses 56 to 69. Jesus said, Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even, those that, uh, even though they ate the manna but will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of his disciples said, This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining, so he said to them, Does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me, for Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, 
That is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe, and we know you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Unless my take on our society is way off base, I would venture a guess that many people, most people actually, are uncomfortable with anything which could be called radical. Whether the topic is business ideas, farming practices, politics, or just about any other thing, most people are generally a lot more at ease with something that's well-established, proven, reserved, traditional, in general, something which is not radical. Now, not that many years ago, we heard the, the word radical a lot, but it was being used in a somewhat different, in fact, in a really positive way. It was being said primarily by youth and young adults who used it in the same way that previous generations had used expressions such as wild, neato, groovy, hip, happening, or to take a historical leap, 23 skidoo. I never did understand that one. But aside from this use of the word radical, I think I'm pretty safe in saying that we don't like anything that smacks of being truly radical. Now, just so we're all on the same page, let me give you a definition of the word radical. In the usual sense of the word, radical means, according to Webster's Dictionary, marked by a considerable departure from the usual or traditional, tending or disposed to make extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, or institutions. That's what radical means. No wonder people don't like anything radical. It, it involves change. That reminds me, how many Lutherans does it take to change a light bulb? You may have heard this before. Well, there's two possible answers. The longer one says, it only takes one person, but everyone else says they liked it better the old way. The short answer, change? I got a kick out of a cartoon I saw a number of years ago. I'm going to get, get it popped up here on the screen. Take a look at this. Now, here's the thing. Whether we like it or not, every once in a while, something comes along which is indeed radical and which we can't simply ignore. We have to look at it. We have to examine it, talk about it, decide what we'll do with it. But even when we do that, we may not examine it too closely. We may not want to talk about it too much. We may not even want to think about it very much because it's, well, radical. It's not the way we've always done it. It may challenge things that we've been taught, in fact, long accepted as being true. It makes us uncomfortable. We may find ourselves having to look at things we don't want to have to look at or to consider things that we may not want to consider. Well, simply put, it, it may call us to change. And so even as we come face to face with whatever it is and have no choice but to examine this new radical thing, we might also carry with us a strong bias against it. After all, if it's radical, it's, if it's a significant change from what we're used to or what we're expecting, well, it, it can't be good, right? Let me tell you a little bit about a man who was truly radical. It wasn't just that he held non-traditional views about things, and he did. But he was also himself a considerable departure from the usual or traditional. He didn't fit into the boxes that people wanted to try to put him into. This man had a tendency to challenge, even call for extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, institutions. Textbook definition of radical and a textbook case if there ever was one. Now, not only was this particular man a radical, he, showed, he told and showed others his radical views, and he invited them to embrace these as well. Worse yet, he didn't even try to, to pretty things up. He knew that what he was saying, what he was doing, who he was, was so radical that most people would not accept him, and that some would even seek to silence him, and silence him permanently. 
But that didn't stop him. You see, his were views that would turn the whole world upside down. They would affect the way people treated other people, the way politics and business would work. They would call for serious changes in the judicial system. And most threatening to a lot of people, what he said, what he did, even who he was, challenged religious assumptions and even the religious institution itself. But here's the thing. Whether the people liked it or not, they could not avoid having to deal in one way or another with this man. There were some who wanted to find some comfortable seat from which they could be, they could be involved, but from a safe distance in the events of the day surrounding this man. But there was no such seat. This man and his teachings were so radical that there could be no middle ground. Either you loved him or you hated him. Either you supported him completely or you sought to destroy him. But regardless of which camp you were in, the one thing you would not find would be comfort. In time, many of those who were trying to be associated with this man but from that safe distance, those who wanted to follow but still maintain peace with those around them, well, they reached the point at which they simply couldn't handle the discomfort any longer. They were unwilling to give up control of their lives to him, unwilling to look at the things he was challenging them to look at, and unwilling to make the changes he was calling them to make. And gradually these, these what, fence sitters, they began to turn away from him. Where once they'd been intrigued by this man, they now found him to be offensive. He's simply too radical, they said. What he's saying is just too unorthodox. It's just too hard to swallow. What he's saying is too hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? In the end, many simply walked away from him, disassociating themselves completely and returning to their old, familiar, traditional, comfortable ways of thinking and acting and being. But, there were some, only a handful really, who when faced with the choice of either embracing or rejecting this radical man and his radical teaching, chose the first option. They chose to embrace him. They chose to give up the control. They chose to trust. They chose to follow wherever this man would lead them. Now they realized that their lot would never be one of comfort. It would be one of difficulty and perhaps even persecution. See, not only had they seen this reality for the man they were following, he'd gone so far at one point as to tell him this straight out. Don't be surprised when this happens to you too. Now, they could have just walked away. And yet, when this man asked them to make their choice in his radical, yes, and yet non-judgmental, gracious way, they chose to stay. Many people, since this man's death, have sought to find a way to make both this man and his teachings more palatable, less radical, if you will. Make it fit more what we want it to be. But both Jesus and his call to follow remain as radical and as offensive to many as ever. The question really for us is this. When we are confronted by this man and his radical views, what will we choose? Will we find his teachings to be too hard to stomach? Are we unwilling to give up control, to abandon our comfortable, familiar, traditional seat the way we've always done things before? Or, when we have the choice to stay and follow or to walk away, Will we, like the few of long ago, reply, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God.
Come and follow me If I but call your name Will you go where you don't know And never be the same Will you let my love be shown Will you let my name be known Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind And never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare Should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer? Blinded see if I but call your name. Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen? And admit to what I mean in you and you in me. Lord, your summons echoes true. When you but call my name Let me turn and follow you And never be the same In your company I'll go Where your love and footsteps show Thus I'll move and live and same God who has come to us in Jesus, who comes to us and calls us to follow, has made us God's own beloved people through our baptism into Christ Jesus. So living together as God's people in trust and in hope, we confess our faith and the faith of the church as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's spend a bit of time together in prayer. God has made us God's children and heirs of God's promise. And so we pray for the church, the world, and all in need, praying, Lord, in your mercy, and responding, hear our prayer. God of courage, 
Bless all leaders of your church, make them ready to proclaim the gospel of peace, and strengthen them to preach your loving word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, bless fields and orchards, protect the land from drought, and bring life-giving rain to support growth. Instruct your people in wise treatment of the world you have provided for all your creatures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, bless all who seek justice between nations and people. Give guidance to bridge builders, heal divisions, and inspire cooperation in times of crisis, disaster, and war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, bless all who are in any need, accompany all who are lonely and feeling abandoned, and remind them of your abiding presence. Accompany all who are persecuted and exploited, and open us to their cries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of change, bless our transitions. Guide all who are embarking on new stages in life, as such, such as a new job, new school, or new community. Help us all as we continue to face the truth of our nation's of our national history and Canada's dirty secret, now secret no more. Help us all to work and walk together along the path of healing and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort, bless all who mourn the death of their beloved ones. We give you thanks for the saints who have gone before us. Renew our confidence in your promise of resurrection and life in the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, let's pause. Pause and take a moment to recognize that all we have is a gift, a blessing given to us by our loving God given to us to use, to share, so that all may know God's loving care. Today I want to encourage you to take note of how God has blessed you, and also invite you to consider how you can share in God's work through God's church. And I also want to thank you for supporting the ministry that we share through your tithes and offerings. The reality is that without your support, this ministry couldn't happen. Do you join me in an offertory prayer? Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. In a moment, we're going to be sharing in a wonderful gift that God gives to us, the gift of communion with our God and communion with all of our sisters and brothers in the body of Christ, wherever they are to be found. So if you want to share in this gift, I invite you to hit pause in a moment and get a couple of things ready, a bit of bread in some form, a bun, a piece of, of bread, a cracker, whatever it may be, a glass of something, wine, juice, whatever. It's not the physical elements themselves that are critical. It's God's word of promise to us that in faith these become for us, the body and blood of Jesus given and shed for us. And even more importantly, that God is present with us. So if you want to share in communion today, just hit pause, take a moment to set these things out, and then come back, hit play, and we'll continue. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn as we say together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent your Son, Jesus, to us, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, his resurrection and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Although we are still choosing to maintain distance from one another at this time, still we are gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, as God's people. So let us pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So take and eat the body of Christ given for you and given for me. And take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. and shed for me. In the bread and wine of Holy Communion, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has himself come to you, and he does forgive you all your sins, and he empowers you to go in his name to share his amazing, unstoppable love and grace and forgiveness forgiveness and reconciliation with everyone you meet. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in God's grace. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, Jesus bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen. So I want to make a couple of quick announcements today. As we're moving closer and closer to September, <laughs> isn't that a mind bender? We're working on plans for opening the doors at Prince of Faith to in-person services again. We'll let you know more of what that will look like very soon, because that's coming very soon. We're also planning on continuing to make these worship opportunities available online for those who, for whatever reason, would prefer to gather, shall we say, in spirit rather than in person. Also, Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, all who wish to and who are physically around are invited to come to the church parking lot for a time of, of connecting and visiting with others. Please bring your own lawn chair, your own coffee or tea. Finally, 
I have some, some long-awaited and exciting news that I get to share with you today. The al Haj family, that refugee family that, that we're co-sponsoring, that we've been praying for, for a long time now, will be flying from Lebanon to Calgary on September 28th. This refugee sponsorship has taken so much longer than usual due to not only the bureaucratic process, which is long enough, but also the COVID pandemic. It's been three and a half years that we have been waiting for this to happen. And they will finally be able to come to Canada. They'll be reunited with family here in Calgary and they'll be able to start a new life in safety. They're not out of the woods yet. Please continue to hold them in your prayers. But we finally have a date. Thanks be to God. Our closing song today comes from the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's a song that we've, we've sung together a few times before. The song, The Lord Now Sends Us Forth. Enviado soy de Dios, mi mano liste está. Sends us forth with hands to serve and give to make of all the earth a better place to live. Los Angeles no God.